Good morning. Thank you all for being here uh, for another of this committee's series of hearings on the role of social sciences in helping to meet some of the grand challenges facing our country today. This is the third in a series. We've all pre previously had a, a, a comparable hearing on uh, social sciences as they impact energy policy and practices. Also then we had one on defense issues and social science applications there. Today we look at one of the other great challenges facing our country and that is health care. Uh, our nation faces a triple challenge of access, cost and outcome. We uh, have 45 to 47 million Americans with no health insurance. We spend more per capita than any other country on earth on, on health care and yet our outcomes are not what they ought to be. And a great number of illnesses are thoroughly preventable and a vast uh, amount of our spending nationwide is related to behaviorally uh, influenced illnesses. Either the, the behavior directly cause the illness or they can exacerbate uh, uh, the, the uh, impact or behavioral factors can impede the treatment process. And this includes everything on the, on the causal part. It includes everything from smoking to some degree obesity. On the treatment side, uh, behavioral interventions have been immensely helpful in uh, uh, helping us address things like adherence to chemotherapy regimes or uh, in the case of, for example, uh, uh, tuberculosis, drug adherence, uh, medication adherence. And these are absolutely critical. And so uh, we believe, as a former social scientist myself, that if we want to solve some of these health care problems, uh, the social sciences have an absolutely essential role to play in that. And we have witnesses today who will share a diverse uh, perspective on that. In a moment, I'm going to acknowledge my dear friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Vern Ehlers, uh, for opening remarks. We also have Dr. Roscoe Bartlett with us here today, and Eddie Bernice Johnson is here as well. Before we do, though, uh, I want to acknowledge a member of the Science Committee staff. Uh, Jim Wilson is retiring at the end of this year. I think this will be our last hearing uh, uh, before this committee, so hence perhaps Jim's last hearing. I'm, he's probably wiping away tears as I speak. Uh, Jim has been on the professional staff of the committee since 1987. Uh, he invented the Internet, the, the Blackberry, and a host of other modern devices. Uh, Jim received his B.S., M.S., and Ph.D. degrees in aerospace engineering from West Virginia University, completed the senior managers in government program at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. He previously managed research programs in fluid dynamics at the Air Force Office of Scientific Research in Washington, D.C., and served as an officer in the U.S. Air Force at the Flight Dynamics Laboratory at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Then he decided to do something with his life and came to work uh, for us here at the staff. He has done an outstanding job. He's a good friend and has been a great public servant. And uh, I just want to express uh, my personal appreciation. And Jim, we have uh, a small token of that. Uh, this is a flag which we took to Antarctica. Uh, and this has actually been to the South Pole and around the South Pole, so it's been in every time zone. That's an easy trip. You just walk around. The, uh, but Jim, please accept this with our gratitude for many years. Vern, I recognize my dear friend, Dr. Ehlers. Thank you for yielding. I would just like to add my accolades. I've worked with Jim for a number of years, and he's always been eminently fair, very thorough, and very capable, and we are certainly going to miss him. I, uh, the only puzzle I've had constantly after all my great intelligent conversations with him is how he, how he ended up being a Democrat. But, <laughs> but uh, that may be a partisan point of view. But, uh, but Jim, we really appreciate your, your work, and we're all going to miss you. Thank you. Uh, when you look at Jim's resume, uh, those, mem those of our members of Congress may not be rocket scientists, but some of our staff are, and that's, <laughs> that's very nice. Uh, thank you for your remarks, uh, Dr. Ehlers. Uh, with that, I uh, am uh, pleased to recognize uh, Dr. Ehlers for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearing will del delve into the public health implications of social science research and its application. Preventing disease and premature death is the underlying goal of the marriage between public health and the social sciences, and the impacts of this research are substantial. And I, I must confess, Mr. Chairman, I recognize we've had all these hearings because you're a social scientist. 
but you've done us a service because all the different hearings we've had this year have certainly opened my eyes to the power and usefulness in the social sciences in many different areas. So I, I thank you for holding all these hearings. The Social Behavior and Economics Directorate at the National Science Foundation provides support for the fundamental research that underpins many of today's public health interventions. In addition to studying the science of the brain, NSF works to integrate the microscopic with the macroscopic actions of our day-to-day -day lives. In many ways, the social sciences face similar challenges as the physical sciences do in bringing an innovative idea from the laboratory to the marketplace. Humans are such dynamic characters, particularly when it comes to their own health, that the scientists before us must juggle many different variables. Conducting gold standard research projects with human subject, subjects certainly poses unique challenges. Understanding the root causes of human behavior and emotion will assist lawmakers in crafting effective public health policy. I appreciate the work of the chairman and the staff on this series of hearings, which have edu educated members and the public about how social science research is impacting human behavior, energy, national security, and today, perhaps the most important topic, how it affects our health. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about the research in these areas, and I thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ehlers. If there are other members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. And at this time, I would like to introduce our distinguished witnesses. Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett is a professor of psychology and director of the Interdisciplinary Affective Science Laboratory at Boston College with appointments at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. John B. Jamat III is Kenneth B. Clark, Professor of Communication at the Annenberg School of Communication and a Professor of Communication and Psychiatry and Director of the Center for Health, Behavior, and Communication Research in the Department of Psychiatry at the School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Donald S. Kinkle is Professor of Policy Analysis and Management in the College of Human Ecology at Cornell University. And Dr. Harold G. Koenig is a Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences an Associate Professor of Medicine and Director of the Center for Theology, Spirituality, and Health at Duke University. As our witnesses know, we spoke briefly before, their spoken testimony is limited to five minutes each for your initial comments, and after that, members of the committee will have five minutes each to ask questions. We are grateful for your years of research and contribution, and that you would take the time from certainly busy schedules to join us today. With that, we'll, uh, we've been joined, I should mention, by Dr. Lipinski, and thank you. And uh, we'll start with Dr. Barrett, please. Congressman Baird, you and your colleagues deserve our deepest thanks for encouraging NIH to support basic research in the social and behavioral sciences. My colleagues and I uh, are very grateful for your efforts, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Seven years ago, when the Twin Towers collapsed, people had many reactions. I'd like to read two to you. One person said, my first reaction was terrible sadness, but then came anger because I couldn't do anything with the sadness. A second person said, I felt a bunch of things I couldn't put my finger on. Maybe anger, confusion, fear. I just felt bad. These examples demonstrate a phenomenon that I discovered almost 20 years ago. Some people feel the heat of anger. They feel the despair of sadness. They feel the dread of fear. Other people use the same words, but they feel, for lack of a better word, sad, bad. Same words, different feelings. Over a 10-year period, my lab found that people like the first speaker who have emotional expertise are more flexible in regulating their emotions. They are more centered. They are less buffeted by the slings and arrows of life than the second speaker. These basic research findings have now been translated into emotional literacy programs for children, teachers, and school administrators. By the end of next year, 250 schools in the New York system alone will participate, and the results are already clear. Children who can identify, understand, and label their emotions effectively have fewer clinical symptoms. They are at lower risk for violent behavior and for drug and alcohol abuse. They have better social skills. They have stronger leadership skills. And perhaps most surprisingly, they have higher scores, grades, in math, science, reading, and so on, meaning that emotional literacy must be a central piece of educational reforms, like No Child Left Behind. 
These are welcome outcomes, especially given the recent UNICEF report showing that U.S. children have the second lowest well-being scores across 21 developed nations. Now, emotional literacy isn't just about happiness. Emotionally intelligent children uh, turn into the skilled and productive workforce of tomorrow, which translates into an increase in the gross domestic product. And emotional literacy has the potential to play a role in addressing some of the nation's most pressing problems. For example, anecdotal evidence shows that regardless of people's plans, uh, they often decide to retire on the spur of the moment after, let's say, a particularly bad day at the office. So instead of retiring at age 67 when they should, or at age 65 when they plan to, they retire on average at age 63. By teaching people emotional literacy, when they're adults, we may be able to prevent that ba bad day at the office uh, from uh, causing them to retire early, um, allowing people more financial security, and saving the government substantially in Social Security and health care benefits. From a purely scientific standpoint, the discovery that not everybody feels anger or sadness or fear has ignited a literal paradigm shift in the study of emotion. We now know that emotions are not simple reflexes that are flipped on like a light switch in certain parts of the brain, which is why there is no single pill that cures depression and there is no single gene uh, that controls happiness. The exact nature of emotion is now the topic of heated debate and furious research, and the history of science teaches us that key scientific discoveries are made during such times. At the frontiers of science, nothing speeds scientific progress like the clash of competing viewpoints. This may not be comfortable, and it is certainly not cheap, but it is absolutely necessary. Science is like a food chain, with basic research at the base, feeding translational research, which feeds applied research, and so on. Without this healthy base, the entire ecosystem becomes weak and can't survive. Basic research in the social and behavioral sciences you know, surprisingly, it may sound surprising to say this, is, is really being starved in America. And without the basic research today, there will be no critical health solutions for tomorrow. It takes time for basic science to feed solutions, often decades. Scientific discovery is like slowly peeling an onion. While exploring one question, other more nuanced questions uh, are revealed beneath. This means that you can't run science uh, like you run on a business model where you set a tangible goal and try to meet it on a strict timeline of five years. Because the neuroscientist who discovered that canary brains can grow new cells after birth wasn't trying to solve the puzzle of mental illness. Social scientists who studied the evils of conformity after World War II weren't trying to keep people from using drugs and alcohol. And my own research on emotion wasn't originally targeted at help ch helping children read better uh, or helping retirees decide, you know, when is the financially right time to decide. Regardless of the goals that motivated my basic research or any basic research in the first place, it's simply a fact that this research is necessary to achieve the critical and often surprising results that help people live healthier and more productive lives. Very happy to be here today to share some of the work that I've been doing um, over the past 20 years or so in the area of HIV prevention. Conducting a program of research that's designed to identify the social psychological factors that underlie HIV risk associated um, behavior. Once we identify those factors, we develop interventions that are based on theory and that are tailored to the population to try to change their behavior. We then evaluate those um, intervention strategies using rigorous scientific methods, usually a randomized controlled trial, which is the best way to find out whether an intervention is effective. Along the way, we try to address some practical questions about the best way to do HIV prevention. Uh, this might be questions about the race of the facilitator, or the gender of the facilitator, or the gender, gender composition of the group, or the age of the facilitator, all of these practical questions about how to do intervention. Then if we find that an intervention is effective, 
we then try to disseminate it to people who can actually use it. So we go beyond publishing it in journals and get it to the end users. Then when the end users are using it, it leads to additional questions about whether it still works. And so we look at that as well. In our research, we found that two of the key characteristics of effective interventions is one, that they're grounded in some behavior change theory, some systematic understanding of human behavior. And second, that they are tailored to the population. And this is usually based on qualitative research with that population so you can understand their beliefs and the context in which the behavior occurs. This slide shows uh, one of the theories that we use called the theory of planned behavior. So it's a model of behavior. So the behavior might be abstinence or it could be condom use. And we basically begin at the behavior and we work backwards in the model. We identify an intention, which is a plan to engage in the behavior. The best predictor of a person's behavior is a plan to do that behavior. And then we look at different types of beliefs that could influence those behaviors. And those beliefs do not come from the pages of academic journals. They come from our target population through qualitative research. We ask them what they believe. Then once we have their beliefs, we then try to develop interventions to target the beliefs, to change the beliefs in ways that are supportive of behavior. So through a mediational change by affecting, building the intervention, affecting the beliefs, affects intentions and changes behavior, and you can extend the model further to a health, health outcome such as sexually transmitted disease. So that's basically how our research is done. Our measures of success are the outcomes in terms of sexual behaviors related to HIV infection, um, abstinence, condom use, and limiting the number of partners. In some of our studies, we're also, where appropriate, able to collect biological specimens that we can test for sexually transmitted diseases such as chlamydia, gonorrhea, herpes simplex, uh, too. And because we want to understand why the intervention works or why it didn't work, we also look at mediator variables, the beliefs and intentions that I mentioned earlier. Because if the intervention worked, we want to know which beliefs were actually responsible for the good outcome that we saw. But on the other hand, if it didn't work, then we want to know, did we in fact change the beliefs that we intended to change? And also, if we did change them, were they actually related to the behavior? And then in this way, we can design better interventions in the future. Um, we also look at the participants and the facilitators' evaluations of the intervention because that's important in terms of whether it's practical and can be used in the real world. We've developed a number of successful interventions. Um, the first five that you see listed there are being disseminated now by the Centers for Disease Control. And we have two others that are efficacious that we hope to have dis disseminated soon, one of which is in South Africa where the HIV epidemic is having the largest impact. In terms of um, scaling up, um, there are a number of issues that come into play um, in terms of whether successful interventions are adopted. Um, sometimes they're not. What are the variables that affect that? Um, interventions often have to be adapted, which means changing them. And so the question is, if you change it, does it still work? So what kinds of adaptations are useful and which ones are harmful. And then the third question is, if it's efficacious in a randomized controlled trial, is it still effective when it's used by teachers in schools or health professionals in clinics? And so research is required to look at effectiveness um, as well. Um, I, we at the University of Pennsylvania in the Behavioral Sciences Corps, we cover a lot of different um, populations and research in a variety of different venues um, which I will not be able to go into um, and we collaborate um, with people in other disciplines within the center um, in immunology the clinical core um, in particular so we see how the different areas of science um, work together with social science to address these important health problems and I will stop here Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, I'm convinced that the social sciences in general and economics in particular have much to offer to improve our nation's health. Nobel Prize winning economist Gary Becker has argued that 
economic theory is not a game played by clever academicians, but is a powerful tool to analyze the real world. Uh, to inform public health policy, empirical health economists like myself combine economic theory with careful analysis of data to try to quantify the impact of various real world influences on individual health behaviors. In these comments, I'll try to overview some research on the economics of health behaviors and provide a few examples of their relevance for public policy, and then make a few comments about the importance of NSF and NIH support for health economics research. Current estimates suggest that almost half of all the deaths in the United States can be traced back to cigarette smoking, sedentary lifestyles and obesity, and alcohol abuse. Some health economics research focuses on the healthcare sector. The research I will overview uses the tools of economics to better understand the determinants of these health behaviors outside the healthcare sector, like smoking and obesity. The economic approach to human behavior emphasizes that people respond to incentives. Consequences for their health can provide people with very strong incentives to quit an unhealthy behavior like smoking or to start a healthy behavior like regular exercise. The history of smoking in the U.S. is a good example. Since the 1964 Surgeon General's report on the health consequences of smoking, the prevalence of smoking among U.S. adults has dropped from over 40 percent to about 21 percent. Econometric studies suggest that improved consumer information about the risk of smoking helped lead to the part of this drop. When people learned smoking was unhealthy, many people quit smoking and others didn't start smoking in the first place. My colleagues and I recently completed an empirical study of the impact of pharmaceutical industry advertising on smoking cessation decisions, another important source of health information. Based on our results, we estimate that if smoking cessation product industry increased its expenditures on magazine advertising by 10 percent, the result would be about 225,000 new attempts to quit smoking each year, and 1,000 successful quits each year. This is part of a growing body of evidence that direct-to-consumer ads increase consumer demand for a variety of pharmaceutical product. Easing regulation on ads for smoking cessation products could exploit more fully the industry's profit incentives to promote public health. More generally, when crafting public policy, it's important to keep in mind the private incentives to improve public health. People want to live healthier, longer lives, and private sector firms can make profits helping them do so. Public policies should be structured to facilitate the public health gains enjoyed when firms pursue their private profits. The prices consumers pay for health-related goods also provide important incentives to influence health behaviors. Dozens of econometric studies estimate the price responsiveness of demand for alcoholic beverages and cigarettes. I've contributed to both lines of research. Research funded by the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, I found evidence that even heavy drinking falls when the prices of alcoholic beverages increase. Research funding from the National Cancer Institute helped my colleagues and I launch a series of studies on the effects of higher prices on youth smoking. To guide tax policy, the NIAAA special reports to Congress on alcohol and health and the Surgeon General's reports on tobacco and health regularly review econometric studies of the price or tax responsibility. Health economics research takes on hard research questions about the impact of public policies on health behavior. While I believe health economics research provides useful guidance for policy, it's important to keep in mind how hard the questions are. For example, over the past few decades, the federal government and the states have launched massive and varied public policy campaigns to reduce smoking. As various policies have been enacted, it's clear that smoking rates have fallen and public anti-smoking sentiment has grown. That teasing out the direction of causality and the contribution of specific policies is extremely difficult. Social science research also contributes to public policy when it reminds us of the wisdom of the old comment, it ain't so much the things we know that get us into trouble, it's the things we do know that just ain't so. This in turn reminds me of the almost inevitable comment at the end of an academic paper, more research is needed. This comment's probably not what you want to hear, but it's not an admission of failure, but reflects how science progresses. Answers to hard research questions are re-examined and probed, leading to new answers and better questions. Research on the economics of health behaviors requires data on health behaviors, factors that influence them. Federal and state governments' data collection efforts are a very valuable resource. The NIH and the NSF Foundation, NISF, 
also provide important resources for health economics research supporting investigator in initiated data collection. An applied field like health economics also relies on insights from economic theory and uses tools and methods developed in econometric theory. NSF support for even seemingly esoteric research topics in economic and econometric theory improves health economics research over time. NIH, of course, provides support for many economics projects with more immediate I believe a source of missed research opportunities is the gap between economists and some of the other social and behavioral scientists, my colleagues here, who design, implement, and evaluate public health intervention. For example, some emerging research is exploring the use of monetary incentives to reduce smoking and drug use. Uh, increasingly, behavioral economists integrate insights from psychology into standard economic models of Data from intervention research could provide a rich source of testing predictions from behavioral economists. Uh, I'll stop with my comments there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Baird. I'm going to speak on religion, spirituality, and public health. In overviewing this topic, I'd like to say that the United States is a very religious and spiritual nation. Stress and depression are common and increasing in our country. Stress affects physical health and need for health services. Many turn to religion when stressed, facing sickness, or disability. Religion spirituality may reduce stress, reduce depression, enhance quality of life, uh, may be related to less alcohol and drug abuse, less crime, delinquency, related to better health behaviors, healthier lifestyles, better physical health, faster recovery, and less need for health services. May also enhance the community's resiliency after disaster or terrorism. Implications for public health and patient care, I will make some of those and make some recommendations as well. 93% of Americans believe in God or a higher power. 89% report a religious affiliation. 83% say it's that religion is very, is fairly or very important to them. About two-thirds of Americans are members of a church or synagogue or mosque. 58% pray every day and 75% pray at least weekly. Uh, nearly half of the country attends church at least monthly and 42% weekly. We know that there is increased stress due to the recent economic downturn. We know that depression is increasing due to loss of jobs and homes. We know that the debt is increasing and people are not saving. We know that youth are facing many, many choices with very few absolute guides in which to guide their behavior and their choices. Population is aging, facing increasing health problems. Fewer saving for retirement, and that's creating fear. Uh, we know that stress and depression affect physical health and use of health services, that uh, diseases like heart attacks, hypertension, stroke, infection, wound healing, the aging process itself appears to be affected by stress and depression, and all of that increases hospital stays and need for health services. Many in the U.S. turn to religion to cope with stress and illness. After September 11th, 90% of Americans turn to religion. That was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine. 90% of hospitalized patients rely on religion to cope, and nearly half in some areas of the country say that it's the most important factor that keeps them going. Hundreds of quantitative and qualitative studies report similar findings. Research on religion, spirituality, and health is increasing dramatically. Prior to the year 2000, if you did an online search, you'd find that there were about 6,282 scientific articles on the topic. In the last seven to eight years, that has increased to over 7,000 articles. Just, be, just in the last seven to eight years, those are the number of articles. About 20% of those are original research studies. So to date, there are nearly 3,000 studies looking at these relationships. More research has been conducted, you know, recently than in a long time previous to the year 2000. Now, religious involvement can buffer stress, reduce depression, enhance quality of life. Of 324 studies looking at depression, 204 
find significantly less depression or faster recovery from depression in those who are more religious. Of 359 studies looking at well-being, happiness, meaning purpose, hope, 278 show significantly more positive emotions. With regard to increased quality of life, 20 of 29 recent studies showing that. Here's just an example of some of the research showing that religious involvement affects the recovery rates for depression over time when you follow people. Religion is also related to less drug and alcohol use, especially among the young. Of 324 studies, 276 show significantly lower rates. Less delinquency in crime in 40 of 52 studies. These are all peer-reviewed studies, quantitative, original research published in science journals. And um, religion is related to less cigarette smoking, especially among the young. 50 of 58 studies show that. More exercise. Unfortunately, it's not related to diet and weight. So uh, whatever reason that is. But also less extramarital sex and safer sexual practices uh, with regard to fewer partners. So 45 of 46 studies show those relationships. Here's a slide I don't show in North Carolina, but I'll show it here. Uh, religious attendance and cigarette smoking. Clearly, people attending services more aren't as likely to smoke. Uh, religion is related to better physical health and recovery from illness. Here's a list of the different diseases, which are less frequent among those who are more religious. This is just an example of survival after open heart surgery. This is out of Dartmouth. You can see that those with high religious support and high social support have much lower rates of death during the six months after surgery. This is a national sample, 20,000 people looking at life expectancy. Among, Afri among, um, among whites, the length of survival is seven years longer among those attending services compared to those who aren't. Among African Americans, it extends to 14 years. Religious persons need and fuse, use uh, less health care services as well. Because there is greater marital stability, there's more social support, they're healthier, and that translates into shorter hospital stays, fewer hospital days, and less time spent in nursing homes because people are kept in the community longer. Here's an example of just of the length of hospital stay at Duke Hospital based on religious affiliation alone. Here's looking at days spent in long-term care uh, after hospital discharge. 50 days in the 10-month period following discharge compared to five days in African Americans. Religion enhances community resiliency to disaster and terrorism. Helps people to cope with stress from an individual level. Helps long-term adaptation. At the community level, religious organizations are present in every community. Clergy are oftentimes the first responders. Religious communities are often present over the long term after many other agencies leave and many national religious organizations are active in disaster response. So what? So what? All this stuff. You can't, you can't convert everybody to become, make them religious. But there are numerous direct public health and patient care implications which have nothing to do with prescribing religion, endorsing religion, or overstepping the bounds of church-state separation guaranteed by the First Amendment. Um, here are some implications for public health. Very quickly, um, more research is needed, don't understand the mechanisms. Even small health effects are likely to lead to big health, public health impact, given that there are 200 million church members, 125 million weekly attenders. While not ethical or desirable to change religion or spirituality, we need to know this information for planning services, health services. They also discover information that are useful for enhancing health interventions in non-religious people using secular interventions. Congregations are one of the few places where persons of all ages and races, economic levels, meet regularly. Uh, you can do screening there, health education, ideal place to educate youth with regard to substance abuse, stress reduction, uh, healthy lifestyles for the middle-aged, training for volunteering and mentorship for the elderly. Altruism is a basic value for churches and Here's, a, here's potential volunteers uh, to support programs um, you know, in the community during disasters and non-disaster periods. Many implications for patient health. Religion may help patients to cope with illness, may help them, may affect their health outcomes. 
Uh, many patients want, relig want their religion acknowledged. Patients have spiritual needs. Uh, patients are often isolated from sources of religious help. Religious beliefs influence medical decision-making, compliance with treatment. Uh, religious communities support patients in the community. We want healthcare professionals to take a brief spiritual history, support the patient's beliefs and practices, identify their spiritual needs, and refer them to appropriate people. Dr. Rec Koenig, I'm going to ask you to, to conclude at this point because we're about four minutes over. We'll get to some of these issues in a second if you have a one or two final comments. But Okay. There are many recommendations, as you can see, for Congress here in terms of research, in terms of supporting congregational health programs, in terms of educating the public, and in terms of integrating faith-based organizations in disaster response. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. And thanks to all our, our witnesses for outstanding uh, comments and observations and, and most informative. We'll proceed now in the uh, questioning. Uh, I'll yield myself, recognize myself for five minutes, and then we'll uh, follow with my colleagues. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all. Uh, as a social scientist, some of the friends here from the social science community will recognize that I have been one of the most passionate advocates and harshest critics of my, of my own disciplines. And the reason is I believe we have so much to offer and we so often don't offer it as well as we can. And the exception of that is illustrated by the testimony today and I congratulate you. What I find most impressive is that uh, we are talking about rigorous empirical designs followed by <laughs> applications in the real world, followed by testing those applications with real-world impacts. And all of this stemming in, in many cases from basic research that then gets moved up as science is supposed to, and uh, with real-world impacts. Uh, what I'd like to do is follow up uh, on, on each of, of the examples, uh, and we'll probably have a second round of, of, of questions as well. Let me start, uh, we'll just follow in order. Dr. Barrett, uh, when you talk about the example of teaching emotional uh, 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 I'm, I'm blanking on the word. Uh, literacy, thank you. Uh, so, so I may, uh, how, give us an example of how you would do that with a person and with what impact that might have. How would it change things? Sure. Well, I mean, first of all, I should point out that I don't personally do work on emotional literacy. That, that work is actually being done by other people. I did the basic research, and my lab pretty much continues to do basic research on emotions. Well, let me jump to the basic research. But, but I can answer that question okay. um, for you. So basically, I mean, my husband tells a joke, right? The joke he tells is that when he first met me, he knew three emotion words, happy, sad, and hungry. And... Uh, my kind of guy. That usually gets laughs, but you know. <laughs> but the point being that um, that what you do, you know, what emotional literacy programs do, is they um, turn uh, people into emotional experts who have a large emotion vocabulary. So they have a lot of different words for emotion, and they understand the distinctions in, between those words. So they understand the difference not just between anger and sad, but between irritation and uh, anger and rage. And they, um, they use those words to um, help them to better uh, s uh, see emotion, you know, uh, more precisely uh, see emotion in other people, to more precisely label their own responses, and um, to better know how to act. So if I just feel bad, that doesn't tell me very much about what to do next. However, if I understand that I'm feeling irritated, as opposed to enraged, then I can um, do, I can plan something more my my response a little bit more precisely. Um, so it basically has to do with using words to um, to shape the experience of emotion and the perception of emotion to be able to see emotions in in others. And this sort of sounds like just wordplay um, until you realize that actually words have uh, are a constitutive role in emotion. That is, emotions, you know, there was just an article uh, in Newsweek this week about emotion, that, you know, uh, uh, fear can be found in this part of the brain and anger can be found in that part of the brain. And, you know, that's a, it's an unfortunate article because there isn't a tremendous amount of science to back up those claims. Um, and so if you take a model like that, then it seems like this is just wordplay. But if you believe that the words that people use and the language that they speak actually has some role in forming emotions and in grounding emotion perception, then it becomes a completely commonsensical uh, thing to do. And your research and, and that of your colleagues in the field has been able to empirically identify that people differ 
in how they process their own emotional experience and communicate their own emotional experience, and that that difference then relates to a host of other variables, yes. and that by, uh, uh, by educating people about these issues, you can then influence other variables. Well. Yes, exactly. So in our lab, we spent almost a decade doing research that was funded both by the, uh, mainly actually by NSF with some support from uh, NIH, but mostly it came from NSF, uh, where we did uh, something called, um, uh, it's, we call it experience sampling, but basically people, almost over 700 people took little palm pilots out into the world with them and we measured uh, a number of things about their emotional experiences and then brought them back into the lab and did very controlled measurements there of their body, of their faces and so on. We actually also did some brain imaging um, with these people. And what we found really clearly was there, there's no question that people vary in, uh, not just in the words that they know for emotion, but actually in the precision of their experiences, um, and that these relate these have um, uh, effects in people's ability to perceive emotion in others and to regulate their own responses and so on. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm going to go over my time just a little bit because I want to follow up with Dr. Jamat. Uh, I want to compliment you for your courage. Uh, in this institution, uh, over the last few years, anything dealing with sexuality has been a target for reverse earmarking. By that I mean members of Congress during an appropriations debate target studies based solely on their title. Dr. Ehlers and I have both been enraged by this in the past, knowing nothing about the study. They just say, oh, this deals with sex. We don't think we should spend any money on sex. Therefore, we're going to cut the budget. What you've done is step forward and said, look, we can make a research-based effort to identify how to intervene in a deadly behavior and disease system, uh, and apparently with good results. Uh, could you p p give us some sense of, of, a, of, of outcome? Just uh, you talked about the various metrics against which you measure. Just give us a sense of, uh, you know, you've got these various intervention programs. What are the outcome? What have we seen in terms of outcome for these things? Uh, well, one study that we, we've done two. Make sure, please make sure your mic's on them. Maybe that's hard. You might want to lower the mic a little bit to yourself. Okay. Hey. Um, we did two studies that were done in, in clinics. Um, and when you're working in a clinic, it's possible to have um, actual sexual behavior, sexual outcomes in terms of sexually transmitted diseases. One study was with um, African American women in Newark, New Jersey. And the educators in that study were nurses. Um, we developed a very, very brief intervention that's appropriate in that setting, 20 minutes. And it dealt with the skills necessary to use condoms and to reduce your number of partners, et cetera. It's and not just how to put a condom on. It's how to convince your partner that a condom is the way you're going to go. Absolutely. And it's using it correctly as well. And we followed the women who received the intervention for a year. And we found that those who received the intervention had a lower rate of chlamydia, gonorrhea, and trichomonas compared to a control group of women who also received an intervention from nurses that dealt with chronic disease prevention. We did a similar study in Philadelphia with African American and, and Latino adolescent girls who were 15, about approximately 15 years of age. They were all sexually experienced. They were in the adolescent medicine clinic. They received the skill building intervention. Some of them received an intervention that dealt with chronic disease prevention. And we followed them for a year. We found significant reductions in their number of partners, increased use of condoms, and a lower rate of chlamydia, gonorrhea, and trich, trichomonas in that study as well. So we've been able to have um, outcomes in terms of sexual behavior as well as um, sexually transmitted disease. Obviously, when you work with younger populations, it's not really feasible to look at sexually transmitted disease as an outcome. So in those populations, you want to look at self-reported behaviors, especially um, abstinence. Um, we have a study that we just completed in, in South Africa that's currently under review, where they were grade six students in South Africa. Hardly any of them were sexually active at the beginning of the study. Their average age was about 12, and only 3% were sexually active. We followed them for a year after the intervention, and fewer of them reported 
sexual intercourse over that period, unprotected sex, and they reported fewer partners, you know, again, compared to a control group that received the chronic disease prevention intervention. So we've had some positive outcomes, you know, not just here in the United States with a variety of populations, but also um, overseas. Terrific, and especially given that you're, you're speaking today in the HIV capital of the United States of America, so these kind of... Dr. Ehlers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick follow-up. Uh, did I understand you correctly to say that your abstinence program actually worked? Because we yes. have a lot of debate about that here in the Congress. Yes, we have an abstinence program that works. Um, it worked in a study that we did here. We've, we've had two of them. One worked briefly for three months, but then um, in a second study, which is also under review right now, uh, we followed the adolescents for two years and found a significant effect of our abstinence intervention in, in reducing initiation of um, sexual involvement. And the participants were grades six and seven um, African-American adolescents in Philadelphia. And again, it was compared to a control group of adolescents who learned about chronic disease prevention. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Kinkle, uh, you mentioned some studies on how the increasing costs led to reduction of use. Um, I assume that applies only for non the beginning of use of non-addictive substances, or would that also apply to uh, s someone who is smoking or someone who's using hard drugs? Does the in cost increase result in less use, or is it beyond help simply because it's an addictive behavior? No, actually, the uh, research suggests that a number of addictive behaviors, uh, addicts do seem to respond to higher prices. Uh, there's a controversially named theory, at least, uh, developed by Gary Becker and Kevin Murphy at University of Chicago called uh, the model of rational addiction. Now, I know a lot of people that almost sounds like an oxymoron, but the basic idea is simply that addicts still respond to the same kind of incentives that non-addicts do, and it may be more difficult, and it certainly is more difficult, um, to change behavior, but again, there's evidence that shows that when the pr price of cigarettes go up, um, people are more likely to quit smoking. Uh, my research found you know, pretty heavy drinking responded, not maybe not the heaviest drinking, but some very heavy drinking seemed to respond to higher prices. Um, and there has been some research that looked into the same kind of price responsiveness of um, illicit drugs, including heroin, and all those find some evidence that higher prices can reduce consumption of these goods even by the addicts. And even for hard drugs then? Uh, the hard drug, there's, there's, there's been some studies. I mean, that's a very, very difficult yeah. uh, thing to study. I mean, basically on the data, we don't know that much about the use, nor do we know exactly about what prices people are paying. So trying to figure out how much prices affect use is a doubly difficult challenge. But there has been, have been some studies that indicate the yes, even the hair. And Dr. Koenig, uh, I really enjoyed your presentation, uh, perhaps because I'm a religious person, but I suspect most everyone describes themselves that way in some fashion. Uh, but what, what are, are there any implications you can draw? You, you can't somehow instill religion in a person to try to improve their health. Yeah. And, and another question is, uh, is it perhaps the health outcomes are related to the fact that a number of religious behaviors are related to health. For example, uh, for years, uh, some denominations have strongly discouraged smoking long before the Surgeon General's report. Others discourage drinking very strongly. Uh, is, is it related to, to that, or is it, um, in, in fact, intrinsic to the belief of the person, him or herself? It's, it's related to actually that which you described, better health behaviors, less cigarette smoking, uh, more exercise, et cetera, et cetera. The, the religious, uh, you know, beliefs that say you shouldn't over drink, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's a major factor. Also, there is the social factor, the fact that people have more support in religious congregations. And then also there is, uh, there is, uh, the cognitive, the beliefs themselves. They're, 
oftentimes are positive or optimistic about coping with stress, w about driving meaning to the negative experiences which help people to cope better. In terms of the applications, uh, there, there are practical applications. Because it's so common, so frequent, that people have religious beliefs and behaviors, how are those affecting health? And how, as people become more secular in this country, how will that affect the increase in health problems? And so those are just one of the issues. Clinically, there's the issue of, of people have spiritual needs and doctors aren't addressing them. Ninety percent of doctors never even talk to a patient about their religious beliefs, and yet those are affecting their compliance, their coping with illness, etc. So those are the issues. Okay, thank you. I, I was just reading the Old Testament recently in the early part of, part of it, and it's just striking reading through all the rules and restrictions that Moses put in place, how many of them re are really health-related. Uh, so this goes back a long way. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. I'd like to uh, thank the chairman for holding this hearing in the... Uh, hearings that we've held and probably most importantly uh, right now is uh, last year in the fight where uh, there was a threat to NSF funding for, for social sciences and um, uh, Dr. Baird really, really stepped up there and uh, I gave him a little bit of help there but uh, we made sure that that wasn't, uh, we made sure we took care of that in the America Competes Act. Um, and. Chairman Baird is the only one who I allow to call me Dr. Lipinski, and this is the only place he's allowed to do it here in this, uh, in this subcommittee. Uh, I do have my Ph.D. from uh, Duke in political science, so uh, I have fond memories of, of Duke, a great university. I, I spent uh, may, many, maybe too many years in school. Uh, one, of the, one of the classes that I remember more from than any other uh, perhaps was when I was at Stanford, I took a uh, degree in engineering economic systems. Decision analysis was something that was uh, very interested, and I took a class from Amos Tversky in um, you know, decision theory, and really the fact that the risk aversion that, that, that people have and how people make choices um, not really necessarily based on what economically um, would seem to be the clear the clear choice. So I I really think that so much of that could be used utilized in making public policy. And Dr. Kinkel, I know you were you know you were talking about uh, incentivizing. We do a lot of that in uh, public policy, although sometimes we don't like to admit that. Uh, but uh, I think a lot of the the research that you were doing, you're you're talking about in terms of smoking. Uh, some of that is. Uh, obviously economic, and you're talking about uh, whether or not the economics actually impacts people who are uh, addicted to, to drugs, and I think uh, that's very important work, uh, but also looking at beyond the, the economics, what uh, psychology tells us about choices that, that, that people make. Uh, what do you, I just want to ask you, Dr. Kenko, what else, what do you think we should be doing more of? here in terms of helping to uh, you know, put the question aside of what policy should we be doing to incentivize uh, what behavior we want to see more of or, or less of here in this country, but what should we be doing in terms of funding? Uh, how could we better fund sh you know, the type of research that would be helpful to us in making public policy? That's a, that's a tough question, obviously. Um, and the kind of social science research that health economists use relies very heavily on secondary data sets. And so, as I said, be mentioned before, I, you know, the continued support and expanded support for the ongoing data collection efforts of both the federal government and also, you know, investigator-initiated um, data collections, you know, I'm thinking about these ongoing longitudinal data sets like the Michigan Panel Survey of Income Dynamics or the Retirement and Health Survey um, provide an incredibly rich resource for um, health economists and other social scientists to both explore the questions that 
you know, the, the data sets were designed to answer, but also a lot of times to exploit them to answer some new questions. So I think a lot of times the, a lot of the economics research actually wasn't planned necessarily to be used these data sets, but we suddenly realized that we could exploit a natural experiment that was created in the data ongoing data collection. Uh, with that, I think um, providing a support for some of the new developments in data collection, um, biomarkers, for example, exciting idea to connect some of the traditional social science kind of variables about schooling and income and socioeconomic status with data actually on uh, much more health-related, uh, even genetic-related information, something they're beginning to use. Uh, the same types of innovations would really um, also be possible, I think, and should be encouraged in kind of trying to provide those links between economics and the other social science. New subfield of economics known as behavioral economics, which exactly tries to do what you suggest, that is, import the insights from psychology and improve the economic models to explore when is it going to be the case where the economic model isn't really capturing fully what's going on and can we uh, get to an improved understanding and therefore also maybe improve public policies by kind of combining our forces with psycho psychological data. And again, I guess it just shows, you know, the kind of research I do, I, I keep on coming back to sort of facilitating data collections and facilitating cooperations between social scientists of different disciplines. Some of the most important ways I think you could support the type of research where I think it needs to go. Thank you. I, I thank all of you for the, the work that you're doing in, in talking about uh, multidisciplinary research. I, I found when I was a uh, political scientist that uh, there wasn't nearly enough of that. It seems like there's more of a push in recent years to do that. So I think that's that's very helpful. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Lipinski. And that actually, the issue of interdisciplinary work is part of what was included in the America Competes Act, of course. And I would note on the issue of behavioral economics, the cognitive economic work, really, of, of Kahneman and Tversky and that group, in my judgment, certainly could help us understand the collapse that this country is experiencing right now. If you look at the cognitive biases and decision-making confirm confirmation bias, for example, is one area. Maybe we'll have a hearing, which would be a, hindsight's 2020. But if you look at the role of confirmation bias, that simple cognitive error is so profound in getting people to believe that this market couldn't do what it has done. Uh, we might be able to somehow prevent uh, 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 prophylactic measures. Cognitive prophylaxis in the financial markets would be an interesting uh, a topic for somebody's dissertation at some point. Um, uh, we'll, we'll have another round, so if you have other comments too, I, I see uh, Dr. Barrett has something, there, but I want to make sure we get to uh, Dr. Bartlett and then we'll come back around. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Dr. Barrett, thank you for your concern about uh, the amount of money that goes into basic research. We are starving it almost everywhere. I uh, regret that we require you to indicate in your grant application for basic research where it might have a societal payoff. We ought to be pursuing knowledge. There will be societal payoff. There's no way of knowing ahead of time where that societal payoff will be. But the average American doesn't understand that, and we have a truly representative Congress. <laughs> um, Dr. Jemmett, uh, your comments were, uh, were very interesting. Uh, HIV AIDS is a very unique disease. It is essentially universally fatal. We can slow the process down. It's the only disease I know in a very long time which would totally disappear in one generation with appropriate behavioral change. Isn't that true? Yes. Ultimately, it would. So your, uh, your research is enormously valuable because let's get there. It's, very unique, kills everybody who gets it, but it would disappear totally in a generation with appropriate behavioral changes. So thank you very much for your contribution. Several years ago, I was driving and over the radio, there were uh, three reports. Two people had died in New York City from something that might have been psittacosis, and if it was psittacosis, it might have come from dried pigeon manure, so there's a fairly serious suggestion we might ought to kill all the pigeons in New York City because two people died. Um, that same uh, radio report 
uh, said that uh, there was a report um, uh, on uh, the deaths that occurred with cigarette smoking. And that the last year, which I saw today, was 472,000. By the way, it took cigarettes less than three days to kill as many people as the terrorists killed on 9-11. And in that same report, there was a report of uh, flying saucers over Oklahoma. Well, I thought, gee, if I was coming in here from somewhere else and I saw a society where the two people died in New York City that might have had psittacosis, and if it was psittacosis, it might have come from dried pigeon, or therefore we're going to kill all the pigeons in New York City. And 472,000 people died from cigarette smoking, and they were still advertising cigarettes. I think I'd want to fly around a bit, too, before I, before I landed. Uh, th this is just, just insane, uh, isn't it? You know, I can't yell fire, fire in a crowded theater because somebody might get hurt leaving. And yet they can advertise cigarettes to my grandkids and my great-grandkids when it kills 472,000. Is there any logic in that? I, I just can't see the law. See, I don't, if you want to smoke, you go ahead and smoke, but I want no cigarette advertising. If I can't yell fire in a fire in a crowded theater, you can't have cigarette advertising. Buy it if you wish, but it's dispensed from under the counter in a brown paper wrapper with skull and crossbones on it. <coughs> a rational society, I think, would, I think would do that. Uh, Dr. Connie, you um, mentioned the um, increase in lifestyle from those who are religious. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and we and Mormons live seven years longer than the average. I don't know that other people are less religious than we. Don't you think lifestyle has a whole lot to do with that? Because we have a very different lifestyle. Yes, absolutely. Lifestyle, behaviors, and it starts from, from childhood on, uh, the way kids are, are taught and the decisions that they make with regard to their sexual practices, their drinking, their smoking, Everything. There, uh, studies show that the religious youth are more likely to sleep better, more likely to take vitamins, more likely to get regular health care, regular dental care. It's it's just impacts in so many ways in terms of their health, their healthy lifestyles, their health behaviors, their decisions. Then why are we so hesitant politically to talk about religion? But it has so many positive benefits. Why are you kind of relegated to the, well, not lunatic fringe, but the, some fringe, and uh, if you talk about religion and you're in politics? Same works in health care. You talk about religion, you're immediately marginalized. Yeah, why is that? I don't know. Any of the rest of you have any observations why you're marginalized, wherever your uh, discipline is when you talk about religion? Dr. Barrett? <laughs> Well, you know, um, a couple of years ago at a major social, the major research conference in social psychology, people asked this question exactly. They asked the question of, you could count, why is it that you can count on one hand the number of social science, social psychologists who study religion when uh, it is, you know, a foundational aspect of, of many, in fact, now we hear most people's lives, certainly in the United States. And, um, you know, I think that the answer that people came up with at this meeting was you know, multifaceted. F first of all, it's um, often, you know, science often overlooks the most obvious things. I mean, overlooks the things that are right in front of you and that seem most obvious, right? Nobody, uh, very few people actually do research on the psychological impact of touch, yet we touch each other all the time. We shake hands, we pat people on the back, we hug our children. Um, you know, there's not a lot of research on this topic, even though it's a very, very basic thing. Um, but also, um, for some reason, uh, it, it, you know, there's a certain um, stigma to, there has been a certain stigma, the same kind of, uh, to religious, to public discourse about religion in the same way that there is stigma for uh, lots of things that seem natural and obvious, I mean, paradoxically, like sex. <laughs> and so uh, the, fa the reason why there's stigma, I don't think anybody really understands, although people are interested in this topic and are starting to study it. but. Um, but there's, uh, you know, sociologists and social psychologists have a, a lot of uh, understanding about um, 
about stigma and how it influences behavior. The irony, of course, is that the federal funding agencies are not funding that. <laughs> they don't fund research on stigma so much anymore, and if they do, it's in very uh, limited pockets. But it's a topic that has been around in uh, social psychology, both from a social standpoint and from sociology, for really for 100 years. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We might look to Hollywood for a little of the problem. Thank yeah. you. And for the problem of smoking, Dr. Bartlett, the, it's amazing the implicit message about smoking that's come through Hollywood in recent years. You can't advertise cigarettes on television, but you can sure show every actor that the kids look up to smoking a cigarette in almost every scene anymore. Uh, Dr. Kinkle, I, I particularly appreciated your comment. I'll recognize myself for five minutes. We'll do a second round. and, and uh, 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 about it's not what you know that's so much trouble, it's what you know that ain't so. One of the great values of social science research is uh, is the uh, counterintuitive finding. Uh, I, I remember some years back there was the program called Scared Straight. This was the idea that we were going to take kids and put them in kids who are juvenile offenders, we are going to take them to the really hardcore, I think they did this in Rahway, New Jersey, we are going to take them and scare them to death and and uh, this was got a national TV show about it and there were programs initiated in state legislatures across the country and then thank goodness some social scientists actually did some follow-up research and if my recollection serves correctly the kids who'd gone through the scare straight program had a higher recidivism rate than the kids who hadn't and and the counterintuitive was a lot of people thought well we'll take those kids there and we'll scare them to death <clears throat> Kids apparently thought, gee, I want to be a bad, tough guy like those guys in prison. And uh, and the case is true in some of our interventions. There's some fascinating research about <clears throat> on the economic behavioral economic realm recently about if people have paid a certain amount, does that provide a disincentive or a justification? And so, so I commend you for raising this issue because sometimes it's not confirming what we think would be, but disconfirming the, the, the so-called common sense assumption. Um, Tell us a little more about this advertising of smoking cessation products. Flesh that out a little bit for us. It's apparently illegal to advertise these things, but if we did, we could sa save a lot of lives. Again, back to Dr. Bartlett's paradoxical. I'm sure that was a negotiated deal with the cigarette companies probably, but... Uh, uh, well, it, it's, <clears throat> it's no longer illegal. Actually, the, um, the irony was of the advertising situation was one of the first things that attracted us to the uh, topic. We were looking at magazine advertisements for these products back in the 1990s when most of these products were um, by prescription only. And because they were by prescription only, when a company could advertise, say, the nicotine patch, but then they would have to have a full page of fine print disclosure of all the contraindications about how bad nicotine was for you. At the same time, in the same magazine, the next page, you could have a pick, have an advertisement for Marlboro's, a, another nicotine delivery system, and they only had to have that tiny little, you know, Surgeon General's box. And so we looked at this saying, you know, why is it that we seem to be regulating the ads for the products that will help us quit smoking and making it more difficult to advertise them than we are advertising for the, for the actual products we're trying to um, get rid of, you know, in a public health Approach. So we actually looked at sort of two aspects of the, our research on the smoking cessation and advertising. Uh, one that I mentioned in the testimony earlier was that when people see more of these ads on, in magazines at first, and we're extending the research to look at television ads, uh, it really does seem to be help stimulate them to think about quitting. And interestingly enough, a lot of times when they think about quitting after they, use the, they see the ads, they don't necessarily even use the product. Uh, which in an economic jargon is sort of a positive externality, uh, the idea that some of the social gains from the advertisements, the, the firms are not managing to gather as higher profits, but they are doing improving public health. Uh, the earlier part of our research also looked at the effect of the regulations on the firm's decisions to advertise themselves, and we found that when firm, when products went from prescription um, to over-the-counter, this changed the way the advertisements are regulated and made it a lot easier to advertise, and therefore the firms advertised a lot more. 
So when you sort of put those two things together, you realize that the way we were re uh, regulating prescription products for smoking cessation actually probably worked to discourage some smoking cessation. But you now can see, so that's no longer an yeah, issue. So now, so now most of the products are over the okay. counter, and that's why they're all. Uh, th but you see the same thing going on now. Uh, you know, the next, another possibility, we haven't done this research yet, would be on things like um, the statins for cholesterol reduction. A lot of the statin drugs are going to still be by prescription only, and therefore they're relatively difficult to advertise. And it's not clear that perhaps the public health goals might be better served if we made it easier to advertise things like statins as easy as it is to advertise the Big Macs that give us the cholesterol in the first place. Dr. Kornig, I appreciate your testimony very much, and I think, I think there has been attention in the social sciences, uh, pro and con. I mean, it, it, is, it is also true that, that some of the criticism of studies for example, in the realm of Dr. Barrett's research and, and literacy, emotional literacy, can also be opposed on the religious side. In other words, there are, there are some religious institutions that pass out to their uh, parishioners lists of key terms that say if your child's going to school and they use the word emotional literacy, well, that's covert secular humanism. And you, I mean, these things, is, is a little less so today, but, but some real counterattacks and, and issues of... Uh, uh, Dr. Jamat's uh, uh, type of research using a condom is implied to instill to promote sexual behavior so therefore uh, it's abstinence only the debate's not about whether the real debate the substantive debate is not about whether abstinence can prevent sexually transmitted disease by definition it can uh, the question is does abstinence only have superior outcomes to abstinence with, with education about responsible decision making, uh, appropriate use of, of uh, uh, prophylactics, etc. Can you t comment on the, the, the dual nature of that tension and, and how we can be sort of more respectful of the, of the positive contributions on both sides? Yeah, the, uh, there are plenty of negative effects that religion can potentially have and uh, those are really understudied as well as the positive effects. Um, there's been such a resistance, though, on within the field of science to study anything about religion at all because of this religion-science conflict. And to try to better understand part of it in the mental health field, as you may know, you know, our profession has, if anything, been negative towards religion. It's, it's excluded it. Freud said it was a neurotic obsession and, and it was unhealthy and you did, you got psychoanalyzed so that you would get rid of it and you'd be healthier. But William some, James didn't. William James, no. He was, he was in favor of, or at least described the phenomena in positive ways. And that created this whole negative view towards religion. And even within medicine today, the only time it comes up is when there is a conflict, when there's an issue of abortion or, or a Jehovah Witness refuses blood products. And then it comes up in the discussions in the teaching centers. But otherwise, these positive effects that we've been talking about are, are, just, are ignored largely because there's fear to talk about it, to get involved in it. And so we need education. Education is critical for health professionals, for researchers, to help them study this area that is so common and has an impact one way or the other on public health. I really appreciate your presence and compl compliment Dr. Ehlers for uh, uh, identifying this aspect of, 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 uh, of the uh, hearing today and would recognize Dr. Ehlers for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and just continuing on that tone, it's always been a real puzzle to me since I came to Washington. If you read the documents on which this nation is founded, uh, it's very striking, and not just the documents founded on, but the writings of Jefferson Adams and so forth, uh, very explicit references to the religious faith constantly. And uh, today, it's the opposite attitude, and I don't know whether to blame Freud or someone else. Uh, but uh, but it's you know the the founders were so eager to defend religion they had the First Amendment guaranteeing freedom of religion. Today it seems to be trying to have a freedom from religion, and I I don't understand the phenomenon myself. The uh, I have to comment on on Dr. Bartlett's comments, my my good friend who 
uh, when you talked about religious stigma and then Hollywood reminds me of a friend of mine who was a movie uh, in the movie industry in Hollywood and frequently is asked to come to cocktail parties generally on a Saturday night and uh, one of his favorite things to do is to go around the room and talk to the actors and directors and all those and ask them a simple question uh, what what percentage of the people in America do you think will be in church tomorrow morning? And in a number of years of doing this, the highest percentage that was ever given him was 10%. The average was 2%. As you said, it's over 50%. There was an incredible dis disconnect uh, between the Holly Hollywood and reality. But it's not just Hollywood. It's a lot of people who uh, feel the same way. In, in relation to, to your comments about relationship of religion and health, uh, we have a mental hospital in my district, which was founded by the de de denomination I happen to belong to. Uh, that's neither here nor there. But they started it years ago and was designed to take into account this relationship between religion and mental health. Uh, they are now, I believe, the second largest mental hospital in the United States. And they, they don't, they're not restricted to religious people coming there, but they have a lot of people coming there just because they provide such excellent care. And that, that's one of the factors in it, and I thought you might be interested in that. Uh, Dr. Barrett, um, oh, I have to comment, too, about the pigeons. I suspect the real reason everyone wanted to kill the pigeons had nothing to do with the disease carrier. <laughs> <laughs> and it was not to drive people out of the world. Yes, right. I, I live in an apartment building. It's just my balcony is constantly littered. In any, any event, back to work. Uh, Dr. Barrett, uh, this morning I heard an NPR story about, uh, which, which relates to what you're saying, about treating ADD and that they found very frequently uh, doing it without medication work better as long as you, as you use the, the sorts of things you talk about. And so it's interesting to see that idea reinforced right here in your discussion, uh, just dealing with, and I wouldn't call it emotional literacy so much as just helping students cope with the real world, which is so different from their imagined world. So uh, I thank you for reinforcing that. Uh, I had um, one other question which slips my mind at the moment, and so I will simply pass at this point. Thank you. I'm sitting here, and I have something else. I was supposed to be at, at 11 o'clock, but I couldn't, uh, couldn't drag myself away here. So uh, I'm going to come back and ask everyone else. I had talked to ask Dr. Kinkle about his uh, recommendations for what we should be doing in terms of um, funding and uh, what we should be uh, you know, funding for uh, what research would be be helpful. But I want to start out. Um, you know, it can't be. Uh, we can't have a, some social scientists without uh, having any questions about measurement. Um, and about variables. I asked Dr. Uh, Koenig about, you, I know you, you're looking at a, a lot of different studies, but I keep coming back to how exactly do they measure whether, is this a dichotomous variable? Someone is religious or spiritual or they're not? Or is there a, you know, is this, this some sort of, um, um, scale of how religious or spiritual someone is, uh, th that's sort of the things that really stuck out. I was wondering, how is, this, how is it usually considered? There's a wide range of ways of measuring religious and spiritual involvement. There's a book called Measures of Religiosity that has literally hundreds of measures with, with uh, psychometric properties all in this one place. Um, it's oftentimes measured by church attendance, which seems to be a proxy for level of involvement in religious community. It can be measured in terms of a very simple question of how important is religion to you. Very important, somewhat important, or not important. It can be measured with multi-item scales. 
uh, there are many different scales. There's an intrinsic religiosity scale that has ten items that tries to capture to what extent does the person's faith, is that the object of their ultimate concern? Does it inform their decisions in life? To what extent does it direct their life and their life's decisions? So there's measures of quantifying, and it ranges from 10 to 50, and you can then look at relationships with all sorts of mental and physical health outcomes. So obviously that's going to have a big impact on, well, the measure is going to be based on probably the theory of what the mechanism may be, and then that's going to have a, a big impact. It's hard, to, it's hard to bring all of those together and sort of make a summary uh, and try to talk about mechanism when you have all these different uh, measurements that are out there. And I, I just want to, I just want to throw that, that question out there. I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, knock down. I just wanted to uh, get some sense from you about, about that. So let me turn back to the other, other question. If anyone else has any comments, start with, with Dr. Barrett. Thank you very much. Um, I, I have a lot of comments about this, so I'll just try to keep it brief. I mean, I think that money, um, you know, investing money in individual labs or in research centers that tries to um, enhance social and behavioral research is great. Um, um, you know, I work with economists. I collaborate with neuroscientists. I collaborate with neurologists. So creating spaces for people to have interdisciplinary discussions is great um, and important. But I think that there are other ways in which the federal government can invest um, that uh, are really important and um, are lacking. For example, um, uh, just having a well-trained, well-educated workforce, scientific workforce, we, we no longer really have that anymore in America. Most of the people that I know, and this is also true for my own lab, have difficulty um, uh, getting the postdoctoral fellows uh, that we need to work on research projects, whether it's within a discipline or across disciplines, from the United States. Right? I just recently hired four postdoctoral fellows, one of whom is from uh, the U.S., and one is from Japan, and one is from China, and one is from France. Now, I am all for diversity, and I think it's wonderful, and I'm not you know, um, saying that we shouldn't have these kinds of uh, collaborations across um, boundaries, um, uh, national boundaries, but there, we really, uh, there are just not enough people who are trained. There are not enough people who are trained at, within a discipline, let alone uh, to be able to cross disciplines easily, and um, we don't pay people sufficiently so that the best minds come to science instead of going into finance, although the current situation <laughs> might change things. But, you know, the, um, <laughs> right. Um, in addition to which, I think some of the, there are real technological issues that have to be addressed that will allow uh, basic social and behavioral sciences to interface with other disciplines, uh, let's say, for example, neuroscience. So right now, if you're interested in understanding how the brain creates behavior, you can measure behavior outside a scanner and then you put somebody into an, you know, a scanner that will image their brain where they have to lie completely and utterly still, right? You can, and you can get really good measure of where neurons are activating in the brain, but you can't measure the time course of the activation. And it turns out that, you know, it, the brain, neurons don't turn on and off like light switches. There's this constant, you know, over milliseconds, um, the pattern of of uh, neuronal activity changes, and these, uh, you know, millisecond to millisecond changes are really important for understanding how the brain is producing particular behaviors. So these are challenges that, um, uh, you know, our country faces if we, if we want to move forward in a significant way. And I would also point out that, you know, I live in Boston where there are a total of 12 research magnets that can do neuroimaging. Um, and there are, you know, I don't know, probably a thousand people who do research on this topic where you're, they're trying to understand how the brain produces behavior, um, and there's very little access, uh, you know, even at an institution where, you know, there are, I have a lot of federal funds, and, um, 
people's desire to be helpful, I, I have trouble actually getting access to the machinery that I need. So it's, it's not just about funding peop labs. It's about creating a workforce and creating the tools. And I think um, uh, we have a lot of work to do on the, both of those fronts. Anyone else have any, want to add anything? I'd like to add something with regard to the area of um, HIV. Um, I think there are three different things that are, that are needed. Um, one is more research on dissemination. Um, we've been conducting HIV prevention research for quite a while in the United States, and we have a large number of efficacious interventions, but yet we're still seeing very high rates of HIV. And part of the problem is that these efficacious interventions are not being used in the community. And so we need to understand why. We have to understand why interventions are adopted and why they're not adopted. We need more research on that. We need more research on how a community can take an intervention and adapt it so that it's more suitable for their population. And that will include an understanding of what are the critical ingredients of an intervention that cannot be changed and which things can be changed. And then the third thing is to look at the issue of the effectiveness of the intervention when it's outside of sort of the social science um, laboratory where you have highly trained facilitators and it's very tightly controlled in a real world environment. Is it still going to be effective? And what are the factors that determine whether it's going to be effective in those settings or, or not? So that's a whole area, dissemination. The other thing I would say is even though we have a lot of interventions, we don't have interventions for one critically important population. And this is the population that's the highest risk population in the United States. It's African American men who have sex with men. They have rates of HIV that rival those that we see in sub-Saharan Africa. And yet, to this day, we still don't have an intervention for them that's based on a randomized clinical controlled trial. So we need more research on that. And then the third thing I would say um, is a controversial area that has come up, and that's the issue of abstinence only. We're, we're spending tremendous amounts of money for abstinence only programs, but the data are just not there. We have a lot more data on efficacious, sort of comprehensive education programs. But on abstinence only, there's hardly any. And I believe that it is possible to develop abstinence only interventions that can be efficacious. But the problem is there's not much research going on right now on that issue. So there really needs to be a lot more research on abstinence only interventions, especially given that they're so widely used and so widely encouraged. Is there a reason there isn't that research? I think only? that most researchers haven't really been interested in it. They um, are of the mindset that, you know, young people are going to have sex. It's impossible to get them to stop. I think that's probably part of the reason. Um, some people promote abstinence from a religious perspective. Um, and many researchers are not very religious, you know, so that's not going to motivate them to, to promote abstinence. So it's not seen as an efficacious strategy, but it actually hasn't been tested uh, very rigorously. Thank you. Now, if, if uh, Dr. Kennedy had anything to, uh, to add there, the chairman will allow. Yes, I, I appreciate exactly what, what you were saying, particularly about the, the fact that scientists are not very religious. And so when you're looking at the NIH or the National Science Foundation, you're looking at review sections that are made up of scientists who are in many respects biased against any traditional form of religious practice or activity. If you have a kind of a new age spirituality or a fringe area of alternative or complementary medicine, they will fund those in a heartbeat. But if you even mention the word of God or anything related to God, it immediately it turns sour. So I think in some respects, making some interventions in order to 
overcome some of the bias on the review sections at the NIH and at NSF I think would be very helpful. Also having awards or having programs where you train young investigators or senior investigators to conduct research in this area, provide them with the expertise to conduct the research. I think that would have big payoff in terms of them being able to write adequate grants that are competitive for funding. Thank you. But I'll recognize Dr. Barlow. I would just note, though, in the context of this discussion, the vast amount of federal money that has been going towards abstinence-only education based on scant research. Uh, it, it, we, we tend, and when Dr. Ehlers was saying earlier, and it, 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 a little bit too much of, in my judgment, of this argument that, that there's an anti-religious sentiment, certainly in the presidential debate of late, uh, and always the religious factor plays heavily. And I would say the abstinence-only advocacy and the vast funding that's going towards it in, in this country and internationally uh, is driven not based on empirical basis, but based on religious belief. And so on the one hand to say, well, we discriminate against religion in our scientific practice, and yet we mandate taxpayers to fund an intervention strategy ba that, is, that has at present relatively scarce demonstrated efficacy, but is driven by a, a largely philosophical slash religious. Uh, and then, so we, we mandate that funding, but then we say there's an anti-religious bias. That's a bit inconsistent, I would just, for the record, suggest. And, and uh, while we ought to study the efficacy, if those studies of efficacy give us differential results, we might want to modify our policy in some way. And that's a difficult thing. If the basis for the policy advocacy was not an empirical uh, position, but uh, an ideological one, that's a challenge for us. Dr. Bartlett? Thank you very much. Dr. Hinko, you mentioned that half the deaths in our country come from um, tobacco, sedentary lifestyle, and uh, obesity. One would suspect a uh, cause-effect relationship between the uh, last two of these. Uh, I think some very bad trends started in our country when uh, the economy and keeping up with the Joneses drove the mother out of the home into the workplace and replaced her with the uh, television set. The first thing that happened was that there's a very positive relationship between the number of television sets in the country and the decrease in SAT scores over 24 years. They still rattle around in the basement and they're not coming, they're not coming up. Of course, as the kids sat in front of the television set and uh, uh, nibbled on the fast foods, uh, obesity became a, uh, became a problem. I understand that the uh, next generation of Americans for the first time ever may live less long than this generation, primarily because of, of uh, uh, obesity. I tell audiences this is a really great country we live in. The biggest health problem of our poorest people, those on welfare, is obesity. Now, isn't that a great country? That's really sad, isn't it, that, uh, that we have that, uh, that relationship. Um, when you ask Americans, uh, do you think your kids are going to live as well as you live, and a vast majority of them say no. And um, when you ask people, do you think your country's on a right track or a wrong track, uh, more people than ever in our history today think that their country is on a wrong track. What can we in Congress do about these things? Which is why we're here today. Let's just start with Dr. Barrett. And if you had a comment on the last exchange, we'd be happy to have that, too. I, I have comments on almost every uh, comment that's been made, <laughs> so I'm trying to sit here not making them. I would suggest, I mean, the comment that you just made, uh, you know, it seems to me that um, the fact that obesity is a major health challenge in the United States and that uh, the children, our children are not going to live as well as, as, as we do, M may have something to do with the fact that mothers are no longer at home or the fact that fathers don't stay home. Uh, but it also has to do with the fact that if you walk into a supermarket, um, you, uh, you know, there's a very narrow strip of fresh fruit at one, food at one end and at the other, 
and the rest of the supermarket is filled with things that are bad for you. Um, and uh, my understanding from uh, uh, you know scientists who study uh, social and behavioral scientists who study obesity is that um, that this problem has uh, a lot to do with the fact that. Um, uh, of the way that food is marketed, what, mar what food is available, and the fact that carbohydrates apparently, you know, which are very, you know, very bad for you, you know, actually trigger the same kind of process as an as a addiction to other kinds of things that are, are bad for you. So it seems to me that this example is an example of a, a problem that isn't going to have a quick fix, that there are multiple causes and multiple um, factors that need to be uh, addressed um, and that there's not going to be any single kind of quick fix, which I think brings to the forefront the point that a lot of us have been making today and that I think um, is a sympathetic, people are sympathetic to, and that is that you know, sciences have to work together. No science can solve the problem, right? There's not going to be a pill that, you know, solves, uh, that, that cures obesity. You're not going to find a gene that cures obesity. It's not going to just be providing people with cheap, uh, you know, produce that will, you know, uh, cure obesity. I mean, none of those things in and of themselves um, are going to um, solve that particular problem. I, I would say that I think, as a general rule, one of the reasons, or at least what I, what I see, is that this is a country that is um, anti-intellectual compared to other countries, that doesn't understand science, that doesn't, that really deeply just, that just un does not understand the value of science for producing better outcomes in life. And some of that um, has to do with education and um, you know, at all levels, uh, uh, just, you know, how well do we train our students about science? How well do they understand what science can really do for you? Some of it has to do with, you know, actually what I've been hearing today a little bit, which is, you know, I have to disagree, Dr. Koenig. I have sat on review panels, grant review panels for the past 10 years. I sit on the ed editorial boards of ev almost every major psychology journal in my field, and I have never seen bias against questions of religion. What I do see is what I also see here today, which is that all of us are the product of the Enlightenment. You know, we're all the product of the belief that faith is something different than reason, that reason has, it's not Freud's fault. I mean, a lot of things are Freud's fault, but that's, this isn't Freud's fault. I mean, you know, it goes all the way back to Descartes and even further. That, that you know, we believe that reason is something different than faith, that cognitive things, you know, that we could solve the uh, crisis, the uh, current um, economic crisis by looking at cognitive mechanisms when, in fact, we know that within the brain, cognition and emotion are intimately tw entwined and that some of the things that Kahneman Tversky discovered are actually emotional effects, um, that, you know, we just, we don't, uh, that we, we use these kind of common sense beliefs um, in the kinds of questions we ask and the kinds of um, things that we fund, and it has consequences in for you know in the end for the outcomes of of our children. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for a good hearing, and thank you, panel. What we really need, of course, is a cultural change. A culture gets what it appreciates. And you might ask yourself. How often does the White House invite an academic achiever there to slobber all over them the way they do sports figures and entertainers? Thank you very much for a good hearing, sir. Thank you, Dr. Bartlett, for your insights. Uh, we we, we want to finish, but if, if there's any final comments anyone wants to make, I'd, I'd like to open that up very briefly. We don't have Dr. Koenig. I have a, actually a, a comment with regard to uh, Mr. Bartlett's uh, question about obesity and the future of uh, you know, the future lifespan. You know, it's interesting that uh, the demographic that you're talking about with the highest rates of obesity is also the same demographic that has the highest rates of religious attendance. So these people are, at all ages, in churches, half, more than half every Sunday. So what a, what a marvelous place, potentially, to take advantage of some of this science that 
with regard to health education within churches concerning diet, concerning exercise, concerning uh, lifestyle changes, and you've got your populations right there. How can you motivate churches to develop these faith mi health ministries where they address these issues in the congregation that could extend longevity, that could reduce need for health services? Um, religion and medicine and health care are parallel ways of enhancing health in many respects, but they're just not communicating. Dr. Kinkle? Uh, actually, I'd like to also say something very quickly, and I think I'd actually compliment several of the other com comments here about the role of um, information as providing consumer incentives, uh, we th as and how that could play out with obesity and perhaps you know with the religion education or with various other um, dissemination of information. And I was struck a few years ago when the Atkins diet came out how quickly all of a sudden there were all sorts of low-carb products just all over the place. And this is an example of, you know, the economist sees this as an example of how the market responds with what consumers want. Um, what happens, though, is we have to be sure that the consumers get the information that helps them want healthy things. And so one of the uh, comments made earlier by Mr. Bartlett was that uh, the high prevalence of obesity among low socioeconomic status, you know, among the poorest, and that's also very true for smoking. And we're we're coming up with a situation where, you know, increasingly, some of these big health problems like obesity and smoking and others are really confined to people with low education, low income, and at the same time, for people at the higher incomes who have access to all these great products um, and all the great information, we can become increasingly healthy. And so the, this a lot of interest in disparities in health linked to these kinds of behaviors and trying to figure out interventions, again, that could help eliminate those disparities and motivate uh, people that are, are the groups that are in the most need of getting this information to use these new products. I think it's a very exciting area for public policy and research. It has interesting foreign policy implications in the developing world. We've gone, in many cases, there's still starvation, but in many developing countries, we've gone from the leading death cause it's, is not starvation, but the non-communicable diseases like diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular things. Dr. Jamal, do you have a final comment? I would just uh, say that um, I, I agree that we should focus on obesity and um, sort of food consumption, nutrition, et cetera. But I think we should also remember that physical activity is very important um, as well. And I think a lot of Americans know a lot about, you know, food and what they should eat and shouldn't and should not eat. But when it comes to physical activity, they don't know how they can fit it into their daily routine, yet it's so important. So it seems like we need to have more focus on that as well. Again, I thank the panelists and uh, uh, the folks in attendance today. Thank my colleagues. Uh, with that, the hearing stands adjourned. I'm grateful for your presence. Thank you.